Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Wake Up with United Way. I'm Afrat Pfefferman. I'm the executive director of United Way. Um, I'm joined here this morning by our co-collaborators from PACE, Mark Fraley. Thank you for all your help with this series. Um, and many other folks who we'll, we'll be introducing soon and on our panel and um, who are supporting this, this, this morning. This is the first Wake Up With United Way for 2021. And so this is a really um, exciting day for a number of reasons. Uh, we're kicking off the program, uh, the lineup for 2021. If you haven't seen it on our website yet, we'll put a link in there. It's, um, it's gonna be a really good one. Um, building on, on all the work in 2020 during the pandemic, now it's time to talk more about how we reimagine our, our community um, and, and all the things that uh, we can do as a community to, to make a brighter future for everyone. <clears throat> and today, um, actually before, before I introduce today's topic, I wanna say a special thanks to this season's series sponsors. We could not be doing this without you. And um, we have a great group of sponsors that stepped up to say, yes, these conversations, this engagement is important. We wanna support it. We are ever grateful for sponsors, including our premier series sponsor, Bloomington Township. Given a big round of applause to them. Presenting sponsors, IU Credit Union and the Community Foundation of Bloomington Monroe County and program sponsors, Duke Energy and Old National Bank. Thank you so much for your support this season. Um, this, this day is a special day I mentioned because not only are we kicking off the series, but it's February 11th and February 11th is 211, 211 day. <laughs> and you've all heard of 211. It's a, a great resource um, that has helped connect people to the services and help that they need over the years. And 211 has undergone quite a transformation recently. Um, you'll hear a lot more about this, about how they um, have shifted to, to be more responsive um, to our, our needs as Hoosiers um, and, and how they've responded to the unique challenges of the pandemic in order to help make those connections uh, between people and the supports that they need. I wanted to welcome a special guest um, who's in the audience, Peggy Welch. It's so great to have you here. Peggy Welch is the Chief of Advocacy Officer in FSSA, where 211 is now housed, and uh, a, a local uh, gem from Bloomington. So um, we're so glad to have you here. And we're so delighted to have uh, uh, our speakers join us from Indiana 211. We have Executive Director Tara Morris and Deputy Director Jamie Farron, who are going to update our community on all that is new with 211. And so I am going to turn it over now to Tara and Jamie, who have a presentation ready for us. And when they're finished with that, we'll take some Q and A's. You can start thinking about your questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat box or in the Q and A function. Um, we'll monitor that and then at the end, try to answer all of them. So with, uh, with no further introduction, let's welcome Jamie and Tara and turn it over to them to hear all about 211 on 211 Day. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Tara Morse. And bear with me for a moment. I had this all set up. So we're ready to <laughs> share our presentation as well as our uh, a quick video that we wanna share with you. We're going to go ahead and start off with the video. We're so excited to have 211 as the newest partner within the Family and Social Services Administration. 211 is a statewide call service for individuals who find themselves with an unmet need. 211 is a safe place that you can call. Um, we are available 24 seven. You can talk to individuals who are highly skilled, highly trained, and they can provide you information about resources in the community. Claro que sí, con mucho gusto yo le puedo ayudar a buscar esa información. 
we do cover the whole state of Indiana and they have a wide variety of services that they cover. And that's why we always tell the caller, if you don't know who to call or where to turn to, just call 211 because we definitely try to guide our callers as best as we could to get the assistance that they need. I think that 211 can be pivotal in people's life experiences no matter where they are. You don't have to have hit your rock bottom. You don't have to be in tears when you call us. You've maybe been sober for three years, but you're looking for another group or maybe you're looking for a job opportunity. And I think that one of the wonderful things about Indiana 211 is that it can help you anywhere along your journey. Everything that we document is completely confidential. Everything we talk about is completely confidential. So it's a safe place that people can share what's going on and they can get the help they need. In times of uncertainty, you can go to in211.org or call 211. We'll help fill those unmet needs and get you back on your feet. Well, we thank you for calling 211 today. Please know that we are a 24 hour service. If you need additional assistance, you can call us at any time. Okay. And let's go ahead to our presentation. Okay, um, so we will go ahead and get started here. Um, again, thank you for um, for joining today, and we're really excited. It is two on one day, February 11th, so we're really excited about um, everything that we have going on at two on one within FSSA. Um, so I just wanted to give you a real a brief overview of what Jamie and I are going to be presenting. Um, our we're going to introduce ourselves, talk a little bit about um, our backgrounds, and then talk about our current lines of business and um, some Morgan County 211 stats, and then some upcoming news that we'd like to share. So, uh, first of all, I'm Tara Morse, and I'm the executive director. Um, I have been with the Family and Social Services Administration for the past 25, 30 years now, and um, have a wide experience within FSSA. So. Um, this has been really exciting for me um, to be part of this transition um, and learning about 211 and being a partner with Jamie, who has deep experience in 211. Um, we have found that we've got a really good match between the two of us and what we know, and, and, um, and bringing the two organizations together has been really exciting. And we are just so thankful for everything that uh, the United Ways of Indiana have done for 211 since. 211 first became a thing back in 2002. So it's been about 18 years. Um, to the foundation that has been that has been laid out for 211 and where it is today when we started that transition over to the Family and so Social Services Administration um, has been amazing. It was a really strong, solid foundation. So we were able to, to pick that up and move it over and now blend that in with everything that we do um, for social services within 211. And so, or I'm sorry, within FSSA um, to serve people in Indiana. So we have found it has been a, a very nice blend and um, are really looking forward to some of the things to come. Um, next up, Indiana is a, a 211 is a free service that connects Hoosiers with health and answers from thousands of health and human service agencies and resources right in their local communities quickly, easily, and confidentially. And um, I think it's really important that everybody knows that, but um, as part of our transition into FSSA, one thing that we're really excited about that we're um, really working on is pulling that data in and then matching that up with all of the data that we already have um, with Hoosiers throughout the state and figuring out how we can best serve people. Some areas of the state might need things that other areas of the state maybe don't need so much of. And so being able to pull all of those, those data points and those resources together to figure out where we can really make an impact and how we can work with our community resources and agencies to share that information. Um, we're really excited about that. Um, and as, as we shared in the, in the video, um, three easy ways to access 211. That hasn't changed. You could call 211, um, text, your zip code to 898-211 and then also online at in211.org. So none of that has changed through our transition. So anybody that was accessing 211 prior to our transition, it doesn't look much different to them. So hopefully that's been a very seamless 
process. And what we'd really like to um, continue to build is those community partnerships and the relationships that we can leverage throughout the state uh, to make 211, um, you know, really something that people recognize. People know when you have an emergency, call 911. Our goal is when you need something and you're not sure where to turn, call 211. So we're we're really working hard this year on on that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to introduce herself, and then she's going to talk about some of our uh, some of the primary work that that we are focused on. All right, thank you, Tara. Good morning, my name is Jamie Farron. Um, like Tara said, I serve as the Deputy Director for Indiana 211. I have been a part of 211 for almost 10 years. I actually started out on the phone taking calls. I have a United Way background. I previously, um, my most recent role was serving as the Director um, at the 211 Center housed in Allen County in Fort Wayne. And that was at a United Way. Um, so together, we have, over the last 18 years, built a really solid foundation that FSSA can build on. Um, through our long history with United Ways, we look forward to the continued relationship, the knowledge, the confidence, and the consistency that it will bring our callers. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit more about the core work that we do, and hopefully you'll learn some things that maybe you didn't know before you came here this morning. So our community navigators um, answer over 20,000 calls per month. Um, we are available 24 hours per day, seven days a week. Tara, can you, oh, got it, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jamie. No, you're fine, you're fine. And so, I wanna talk a little bit more in depth about what it is that we do 24 seven every day. Um, recently, um, we started screening individuals who call 211 for, the so for social determinants of health. So regardless of why the person is calling, so they may be calling for food, while we have them on the phone, we're gonna to talk to them about their housing and their insurance and their transportation needs so that we can really start to address things at the root cause. Um, you know, We don't want the Band-Aid fixes. We don't wanna just give people a telephone number and send them on their way. We wanna educate them about the programs that are available in the community. And um, in order to do that, we really need to understand their situation. Um, another thing that a lot of people aren't aware that we do is if you dial the toll-free number to make a, an adult protective service report, you're actually going to talk to somebody at 211. The great thing about that partnership is that not only can we accurately document what's going on, we can also provide resources to that individual or that family that can keep them supported um, and, and possibly resolve some of the issues that they're seeing. So we have a database chocked full of resources and we actually populate the database for the aging um, and uh, AAA agencies, the aging area agencies on aging. Um, we also populate the resource database for the mom's helpline and the help me grow. When we are on calls, we can ask families who have children under the age of five if that's something that they're interested in, if they would like information about child development or if they'd like to get involved in the programs that support families. And so that's a really exciting seamless referral that we can give individuals. Um, you saw in the video, Lizzie, um, she is our domestic violence outreach coordinator. And so we are going, obviously with the pandemic, we're not physically going, but we are trying to make our presence known across the state as a place that people can call if they are affected by domestic violence. Our navigators are trained to assess the situation. Obviously, again, we have that, that rich database that we can provide lots of referrals, but we can also help them safety plan and, and do follow-up calls as necessary. Um, Last, we also, if someone is calling and they have food needs, actually, again, because we're screening for the social determinants of health, um, you know, they may be calling for something else. But when we discover that they're, uh, the question that we ask is actually, do you run out of food before you're able to buy more? And so if we identify that a household is um, affected by that, we can provide food resources. Our communities are, are really blessed with lots of 
um, resources for food, but we can also screen them for SNAP because a lot of people, especially over the past year as things have changed, a lot of people are eligible and they didn't realize it. So we can screen them, we can let them know um, what the application process is like, and we can kind of start that process um, along the way for them. Some other exciting things that we do is we do a lot of work around substance use disorder and mental health. Substance use disorder, actually, when you call into 2 on one there is an option um, that you can select just to talk to someone about substance use disorder and mental health. The Open Beds program you may have heard about, it is a program that we can actually go in, it's a platform that we can go in online and we can assess individuals. Um, it is an assessment that the Department of Mental Health and Addictions um, helped, uh, helped develop just for 2 on one and we can determine, you know, what the level of the best level of treatment might be for an individual. And then we can use that platform to go in and physically see who has beds open, who has appointments available, what the intake process is. And so that, you know, we've always, we've always handled calls related to substance use disorder, but this really gives, again, it gives us the opportunity to do that seamless um, that seamless referral to do the follow-up calls and to make sure that we're getting people connected to the resources that they so desperately need. Along with that, um, it was really exciting when we lost when we launched Open Beds because we could get people connected to resources all over the state of Indiana. Uh, the problem was obviously, um, as it is in most communities. Transportation. Um, transportation, if we could find someone in a bed in a neighboring county, um, you know, they had no way to get there. And even if it was in the same county, sometimes they had no way to get there. And so we were able to partner, partner with Lyft and people can call 211 and we can get them to and from substance use disorder treatment. We also partnered with the Indiana Peer Recovery Network. And so whether that person calls in and they select the option for the Peer Recovery Network, or our community navigators are talking to someone on the open beds or lift line. If they're having a day that they're really struggling, we can actually get them in touch with a peer that they can talk to. Um, and that peer will kind of take over and um, make sure that that person is getting connected to resources and is supported through their, um, through their treatment journey. Lastly, um, hopefully you've probably heard about Be Well Indiana that has been, um, on the media, I hear commercials for it all the time, which is a really exciting thing um, for us at 2 in to hear um, to hear Be Well mentioned. Be Well is a helpline. We have 38 trained counselors that are available 24 seven to talk to people who are impacted by the stress and um, you know just the the um, the mental health um, impacts of living through a pandemic. Um, we answer over 8,000 calls per month and have provided over 2,000 hours of counseling. Again, Be Well is available 24 seven and individuals um, who are struggling can contact us. Okay, next up is, um, I'm gonna talk about the COVID-19 vaccine line. And this was quite a large um, undertaking that um, 211 was asked to participate in. So what we found is that um, there was a concern that people had some vaccine hesitancy or had a lot of questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. And Department of Health um, came to us and said, can you help us um, assist with educating callers about the vaccine? So that was our number one primary focus. And when we engaged in this, we thought it was going to be a fairly small expansion of our COVID-19 vaccine line. And um, we quickly realized that not only would people have questions um, to, that needed to be answered, but then we also have people that, that have barriers to technology or access that might make it difficult for them to actually go on to the online system and schedule their appointment and complete their registration. So we then um, expanded further um, to our number two goal with the vaccine line, which is to assist with scheduling and registration. So with that expansion, we've, um, we've brought on um, over 200 um, agents on the 211 side. And then we also have leveraged our um, Maximus vendor who does contact tracing. And so we currently have um, over 700 
people trained to um, answer calls um, about the vaccine and, um, and also help people register. And all of our information that we are sharing with people when they call the vaccine line is directly from the Department of Health. So it's really important in our partnership with health that the messaging is the same regardless of who it comes from. So we've also worked with um, the library network um, to also educate them about what we're using. And so we have an FAQ that is shared with that community. Um, it's shared with um, our 211 um, vaccine line and then any other resource. We have our managed care entities for Medicaid who are also engaged in this process. And we're all using the same source of truth for information because it does change rapidly. So we wanna make sure if someone calls and has a question that no matter who they call, um, that they are going to get the same answer. So 211 has been a, a big part of that. Um, we answered over 391,000 calls in January and the first week of February on our 211 COVID-19 vaccine line, which is really exciting. Um, and we've addressed 30,920 questions from callers and then scheduled um, about 10% of the age group eligible appointments, which is um, up to date, that was 50,308 through the first week of February. So we know that um, this was a need that we had in Indiana for people to get access. And so I think what's exciting is that we have, um, have been able to take one won this foundation and we've been able to leverage it to add other things where there's a need in the community. We know that this need might not exist for a long period of time, but it really took us about a week and a half to get everything figured out to be able to expand this line. And so I think that's what's really exciting um, because of the support that we got through FSSA. We were able to, we have um, IT experts, we have data experts. So we have a lot of support. It's not just Jamie and I saying, oh yeah, we can do this and then figuring out how to expand it. We have an incredible team of people behind us that allowed this to happen. So I'm really excited about, um, about some of the future things that we can do with 211 now that we've done this and, um, and, and it seemed to go pretty well that we've, I've got some exciting news at the end of the presentation about something new that we're going to be doing. So um, and I do want to apologize. Um, I think on the first slide, that is my typo. Um, I mentioned Morgan County, and I know we're talking to Monroe County, so I apologize for that um, mistake earlier. I get busy and, um, and just uh, made a mistake, so I apologize. I wanted to call that out just um, in case anybody noticed that we do recognize um, which county we're talking to today. So um, thank you for that, and I think uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to go through some of those statistics. All right, and Tara is one busy lady for sure. Um, we were really excited to be able to share the information about the vaccine line. Um, the call volume that we have um, we have experienced with the vaccine line and the exposure and awareness that that has built has been really amazing. Plus, just the fact that we're able to get pe people connected. Um, Again, been with 211 a long time, and I, I would have never imagined um, that we would be able to do um, that scope of work. But um, our local um, work is just as important. Um, we need to make sure that um, when people contact 211, that they're getting the most current information. And that's, again, where we depend on our community agencies to keep their information updated, um, to let us know when there's changes. Um, we also understand that our local United Ways really have the pulse of what's happening in their community. So um, we're really appreciative of that. And in return, um, we can share information about the calls that we're receiving. So in Monroe County, um, in 2020, we handled almost 5,500 calls. Um, that resulted in over 6,000 referrals. We did have about 494 unmet needs, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, about a quarter of the way through the year, we started asking individuals because it, it, it definitely had an impact on our call volume. We started asking callers if their call was related to a financial impact of the pandemic. And about a third of the callers said that yes, that that, that was um, the reason for their call. Um, on the next slide, you're gonna see the top five needs. Uh, these pretty much stay the same, but this is a really great way, again, for us to understand what's happening in the community. If something moves up to the top of the list that we don't normally see, we can reach out to local communities and we can help, um, help 
them understand or have them help us understand what's happening in that community. So electric service payment assistance um, is always at the top of the list. Rent payment assistance, we expect that that's going to continue. Uh, those requests are going to continue to grow. Food resources, always, always a top need. In Monroe County, we also saw 298 calls for someone looking for a homeless shelter. Um, also kind of related to that, we saw um, almost 200 people um, calling us because they needed information about how to find housing in Monroe County. Top five unmet needs. So we've got electric payment assistance. Um, oftentimes those kind of um, go hand in hand. If, if you um, have a lot of needs, unfortunately that results in a lot of unmet needs as well. So electric payment assistance, rent payment assistance, homeless shelters, uh, holiday gifts and toys. So Christmas programs looked much different this year. And so that did result in some unmet needs and then mental health crisis lines. Now, we talked earlier about the fact that we have the Be Well crisis line. It's part of 211. We can get calls transferred over very easily. Um, unmet needs, it's important to understand that it's not always just because there's not a resource. It could be because the person um, is ineligible for the resource or they decline to utilize the resource. So that's important to understand. In our reporting, we can break down that information if ever anybody has um, would like to see more detailed information. Um, same with the referrals that we're providing. So these are the top five referral agencies in Monroe County. And again, we have the ability to run reports to find out exactly what it is that we're referring to these agencies for, um, the zip codes, the uh, family composition, you know, whatever information is um, useful. And so we've got the Salvation Army, Beacon Shalom um, Community Center, St. Vincent de Paul, um, Monroe County United Ministries, and South Central Community Action Program. EAP is always, Energy Assistance Program is always a high call volume um, for us. And that's great that we're able to get people connected to their local programs for that. And it is, it is EAP season right now. So um, our last slide that we have on statistics is just the um, top five zip codes. And so that really breaks out, you know, where people are calling from. Um, with the support of FSSA and their expertise and their data team, um, we hope someday that we'll be able to actually provide heat maps that can show where the needs are, um, that can show the demographics and that type of thing. So, but for now, um, we do have the ability to track it by zip code and by town. Um, and so that's the information that we have, plus a whole lot more. Um, we look forward as we continue um, as we continue our transition to the data, or I'm sorry, to the FSSA, um, they are also going to be taking over on our reporting. And I um, hope that it won't be long until you see these reports on a regular basis. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so upcoming news. So as I mentioned, we have, um, you know, we've, we've been looking at opportunities where there's a gap and um, we can just leverage what we already have built to figure out um, how can we help. So Indiana 211 is partnering with Indiana Housing um, and Community Development Authority to expand for the Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which can provide rent and utility assistance to people who qualify. And there'll be an option in our IDR for people who need assistance in completing the application. So I'm sure you're familiar with this program. Um, it is, um, statewide, there are a select few counties who opted to, to uh, manage their own program. Um, but for the most part, um, I would say there's um, probably 85 counties at least that are participating. So we are bringing in um, some new agents who will be answering calls just to help people complete the application. Um, and I believe that the program um, kicks off on February the 17th. So we're getting really close to that date. Um, so that is kind of an exciting way. They came to us, they, they needed to um, have a way for people to call um, and who need help with the application. I think we all have to understand that as automated as we make things, it's wonderful for people who have access to the internet, to a computer, um, you know, or a phone that can actually you know, handle data. So I think, um, you know, that's one thing that there's always going to be a need for people to connect to someone. And one of our goals within FSSA for 2021 
was to create some public awareness. Um, like I said, that, that people just know what 211 is. And you know, there's a, one of my friends when I told them I was getting in, um, going to be taking this position, they said, is that where you call to dig? <laughs> and I thought, okay, we have some work to do because in local communities, I think 211 is well known for people who have leveraged those services in the past. But I think statewide, we want people to know, call 211 if you need something. And, and we also know that, um, you know, the governor has definitely helped that effort um, when he says in the state of the state address a few weeks ago, it's as easy as calling 211. That was really exciting to us um, because that's the type of recognition that we're looking for because the more that people hear that, the more likely they are to call and we can connect people to what they need. What we've seen through this pandemic is that, you know, we all know there's people that have never had a need. They've been self-sufficient and haven't had a lot of needs. We have a, a significant increase in our mental health concerns um, across our state. We've had significant concerns with people not, you know, being able to, to pay their bills or concerns about quarantine. That creates a whole social set of issues for um, teenagers, for adults, isolation, loneliness, um, just not feeling connected with peers. So I think um, 211 has played a significant role in that. So we're really looking forward to um, 211 being that place where, where people know about it and know that when they call, they're going to get answers. That's been the goal from the very beginning. Um, but I think um, because of some of the things that have happened with the pandemic, it has made 211 more relevant um, to a lot of people. So we're looking forward to um, this partnership with IHCDA and being able to assist them um, with getting people the, the completing, completing the applications and getting them um, to the, some of the resources that they need. Because even though rent maybe was, um, it was a, there was a moratorium, that didn't mean that people didn't have to pay it at some point. So now we're at the point where hopefully some of, some of our people who are really behind in their rent through this program they can not only get caught up, but can also pay forward um, for some future months as well, depending on their situation. So we're looking forward to um, our involvement in that program as well. And I think with that, we have, um, we're at a point now where we can open it up for questions. Sorry, we both talked fast. We knew this was gonna happen. <laughs> Oh, that was, <laughs> and we have a lot of information. We could talk about 211 all day, but we, we want to make sure we're getting to what's really important to you. Absolutely. And, and that was fantastic. Um, I mean, I'm just struck by all of the things that, that you've been doing and, and all of the, the issues that you impact. I mean, you're talking about substance use disorder, transportation needs, mental health needs, food, shelter, rent assistance, um, and then to have that needs data. I know that United Way relies on 211's data to help us with our you know, strategic investments um, in the community. So yeah, just amazing the, the innovation and the, the partnerships that you've developed to, to be responsive. Um, and it does look like we have a couple questions. So uh, the, the first one is, how do you keep the services available um, up to date? So how, how do things stay up to date on um, your database, uh, you know, so, so that when people call, they're receiving the most up to date information? I'll let Jamie take that one. All right. So we do that in a couple different ways, a few different ways. This is, this is a challenge. It is the most important work that we do. We have to have good data. We have to have good um, resource information. So agencies can actually go on our website at any time and review their information. Um, our website is in211.org. They can review their information. They can submit changes. And then our database team will reach out to them to verify those changes and get them added. We also send out, um, every six months, we sound, send out a... Um, a communication um, requesting updates. And so it provides a link and says, you know, can you please go on and verify your information that is that is sent to every organization in our database. Um, sometimes it's maybe not going to the right person. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we're keeping up with that as well. Um, 
an agency has to update with us and we call it a formal update, meaning they talk about all of their information at least annually in order for us to, we are AIRS accredited. AIRS is the Alliance for Information and Referral Systems. Um, and in order to maintain that accreditation, we do have to make sure our resources are updated um, annually. But I also think it's important to know that we hear things from callers and we follow up on those leads. Um, we have agencies call us that say, you know, hey, you know, we heard about 211, we'd like to get listed and so we can get them in our database really quickly. Excellent. And certainly on our end, um, we can help share that message that when your services change, maybe your hours change or something new, um, update 211 proactively. Great, great. A um, few other questions. Let's see. Um, there's, there's a couple about the relationship with township trustees because they do so much of the you know, assistance for rent, mortgage, utilities. Um, how often do you refer people to their trustees and um, anything else you wanna say about that channel of referrals? I can take that one too. So right. we refer to township trustees all the time. Um, a lot of communities really depend on that, um, you know, that first line of defense um, for services. Um, they require that a person has an action letter. So as we go through our referrals, we're making sure that we prioritize and we explain to people, okay, this is your first stop. This is where you can go if they're not able to help. Um, with the township trustees, we also understand how it is, how important it is to get the person to the right township trustee. And so we do use um, the Census Bureau's um, locator tool to find that information. We search their address um, and we get that information. We've got some exciting partnerships on the horizon um, with the township trustees um, because we do. I mean, we're, we, although it doesn't always show up in our reports because there's so many different township trustees, uh, we're referring to them um, a lot. Yeah, excellent. Um, and, and let's talk other referrals. Um, we've got a question about whether you're seeing an increased amount uh, in requests for car payments. Um, how's that particular request handled? Are there resources out there? Do you try to steer people towards other financial assistance? Exactly. So there's not a lot of resources for car payments. Um, most agencies and township trustees are really helping with those basic needs, although we understand how important transportation is. Um, over the last year, we've actually seen some pro um, programs pop up across the state, uh, specifically addressing um, transportation needs and whether that's a car payment, car insurance, uh, you know, the license plates, car repairs, that type of thing. So that's been a, that's been a pretty interesting thing to see. But most of the time, uh, we do a lot of brainstorming with people on the phone and just, you know, talking to them. Maybe they're not aware of the energy assistance program. And so we can talk to them about that, that maybe they can put some money towards their electric bill or their rent and, and be able to make that car payment. And it, it, are those requests ones you've seen go up or down or stay about the same lately? I, I would say that when the pandemic first happened and there was, um, you know, a lot of people off of work, you know, unexpectedly that, yes, we saw an increase in that. And, you know, people just worried, OK, if I can get back to work, but now I don't, you know, I don't have a car, I don't have the ability to get there. So that that was a little bit of a challenge. But um, the need for transportation um, assistance, whether it's car payments, bus passes, you know, whatever it looks like, um, has always been um, a very uh, frequent need, a barrier to services, and often an unmet need. Yeah, yeah. I want to um, further what Jamie just said about, you know, when, when someone calls 211, um, of course, our primary goal is to connect them to resources. But as Jamie mentioned, you know, somebody who we maybe we don't have a program we can find for them that will pay their car payment. However, Sometimes it's as simple as having a conversation with that person, like Jamie mentioned, and okay, well, maybe if we could get you into an energy assistance program, that would free up the $75 a month you're paying for your one of your utilities, and you could put that towards your car payment. So I think um, that's what's really important to understand about 2 on one is that we are, we are really looking at the whole person. So what we find is someone might call and like in that example, they, they're calling because they, they don't know how to make their car payment and they need help. But in the conversation, we find out they've been unemployed, but they didn't realize they could apply for unemployment. 
they don't know where to go to do that. Mm -hmm. Didn't know they were eligible. And so we, we can get them connected to that. Okay, well, that can help with their car payment if they have some type of income. Right. Or, you know, we find out that, you know, they've, they've been going from job to job to job, and maybe if they could get their GED. So we can connect them with an education program. So I think it's really, it's, it's, I, it's just a really special, unique um, opportunity when someone calls 211 that it's not just about their immediate need for the call, but sometimes it's four or five things that we can connect them with that actually then starts to make a difference. And that's really where the, the social services part of this and, and being connected with FSSA, that's that's how you make a difference in someone's life. You know, that immediate need, obviously we want to meet, but it's really that whole package yeah. of why is this person struggling? How can we help them move forward to see some hope? and take them to the next level. Just like somebody mentioned, you know, taking two on one to the next level. Our, our mission is to take people to their next level of what they can do. So I think that's what's really exciting about two on one. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Insert that. <laughs> it, it really um, speaks to a, a comment and question about um, how, you, how you train the, uh, the folks that, that answer the calls because they need to be um, problem solvers. They need to um, know the the landscape of, of and continuum of services that are out there, um, or at least you know know the the types. Um, obviously, that's what the database is for. But they need to be able to to talk people through these problems. And so, how do you um, how do you handle that challenge of training? Um, the, the staff that answer the calls to be able to do this most effectively? So our training um, currently lasts about 80 hours. Um, a lot of what goes into when we talk about um, training for all of the different um, services that we offer, some of that comes with the hiring, just making sure that we're that we're identifying that skill set. A lot of times people coming from case management that have a really wide understanding of services are a really good fit. Um, but we don't train every individual on every different project. Um, there may be half of our staff trained to take open beds and the other half, um, maybe their skill set is more aligned with APS. So it's really understanding when they come into our team um, what their, you know, what their um, strengths are and then kind of working with them as they develop. Now, uh, the vaccine line and the Be Well crisis line, they are staffed outside of the 211 community navigators. Um, and so that's important to understand as well, because that's a, that, those are very special skill sets and, and a lot of training that um, we need, our, we need our, our community navigators handling those 2411, those core 211 calls. So, okay, excellent. Um, talk to me a little bit about. I, I know you, um, you get feedback from your clients, from the, the people who call in and, and use the, the line. Um, what does that look like and how does it inform 211? And you know, maybe if you can speak a little bit to that, um, there's a, a, a question about that in the chat. So we do have uh, the ability to do outcome surveys. This past year has just been, I mean, we have just been focused on trying to get people connected, but like ideally we are following up with about 10% of our callers um, on random, you know, just randomly selected, but with their permission to make sure that they were get the, get the, that they were able to receive the services that they needed. Um, that's another great way for us to identify if there's things in our database that need to be um, researched more. Um, but it's also about the service that they're provided. Uh, we have the ability with our phone system that we can actually do an automated survey at the end of the call. Um, so we do have um, kind of campaigns where we'll do that from time to time, but that feedback is really important. In the past, we've actually also uh, reached out to our agencies and sent out kind of a mass survey saying, how can we serve you better? Because, you know, although we're serving the people who call us, um, you know, a really important part of our work is getting people connected to our agencies in the best way, so. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and what kind of agencies are on the list? Um, how, how, how broad is it? Um, maybe let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, how do you screen them? Do they have to meet certain criteria, provide certain services to be in the database? Um, 
talk to us a little bit about that and um, the types of, of agencies that would show up in, in your database. Go ahead, Jamie. Can we take that one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we have an inclusion policy. And again, that's part of our accreditation. We have to very specifically outline that inclusion policy is available on our website to anyone for anyone to review. But we have to have a very specific um, requirement for agencies. Um, most importantly, that they're providing a health or human service. Okay. Um, you know, we um, make sure that they don't discriminate. You know, there's there's very specific things. They have to be in existence for a certain amount of time because we, we want to make sure that they're established. We don't want to um, cause problems for people that, you know, just make their, their situation worse. So we're really careful about who we refer to. Um, we only refer to agencies who give us permission. So all of the information in our database has um, directly come from an agency that has said, I give you permission to provide this information. Some agencies only let us provide, you know, information on certain programs and that's that's fine. Um, some agencies have what we call secondary services. So um, maybe you can um, get transportation to a, uh, to a parenting class, but we don't list that as transportation. We list that as a parenting class and then that's a secondary service. So you have to become a client in order to obtain that. So sometimes that's confusing for people. We also try not to duplicate work. And so if the area agency on aging has a list of all the nursing homes, we're not gonna duplicate that and also create a list. We're gonna get them connected to the experts. Same with childcare resources, um, a lot of disability resources. We're gonna get them connected to the experts that have their own database of things. Um, but government agencies, uh, social service agencies, we do have some medical agencies. Um, but we have to be very careful because we want to make sure that they provide some kind of service on like a sliding fee or, um, you know, free, something like that in order to be added to the database. Okay. Do you have any agencies that um, help people apply for things like disability? I know you mentioned earlier that unemployment was one that your navigators would help people through. Um, is, is that part of the, the scope of, of your work? So most of the time, if someone is looking for help filing for disability, we get them connected to legal, the free legal resources. Some of them are not able just because of the time, the time that, that it takes um, commitment. Um, but some of the legal resources are able to help with that. And so we can, we can do that. Um, sometimes, I mean, like case management, that is just a wonderful resource. If we can get people connected to case management, that, you know, a lot of times can help with all of those applications and resources that they're struggling with, so. Very good, thank you. Um, folks, feel free to put in more questions. We've got a few minutes left uh, for Tara and Jamie or any other thoughts or um, reflections, feel free to put in the chat box. Um, there's a question about uh, advocacy at the State House. Uh, 211 was managed differently as a sort of partnership. Um, and there was a lot of advocacy through United Ways and other networks um, in order to advocate for its funding and, and so forth. Um, now it's housed in the state, right? So it, it must work differently in terms of um, get, you know, getting feedback to the, to the policymakers and, and advocating for it. It's, is it more internal now? So or there's, a couple, there's a couple things to that, obviously, because it is part of the state. We have to, you know, we have our, we have a great director of policy who works with us um, to make sure that whatever we need to move, you know, into legislators, that they have that information and that they have FaceTime. So we right. definitely have um, a very strong advocacy right. within the state house. But I think part of that to, to feed into that is like what is important is we have a, um, an advisory board of over 30 individuals that that is re really where uh, we meet. Um, we've only met once, obviously, because it was in December of uh, 2020. But that is our goal is to, to hear what's going on first. We need to share what it is that we're doing. And then we need to know from the community what is it that of all of all of our advisory board members, they were, you know, they're on the board for a reason. We have representation through United Way, through our state, other state agencies and, and, and groups, as well as our community partners. 
-hmm. And so part of that is to make sure that we are getting information about what's really important. What, what do we need to be advocating for 211? Because we have our agenda, we have mm -hmm. our goals within FSSA, but that is, that is fed and developed by what we're hearing in the community. So it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a whole process. Yeah, and, and any um, suggestions on how individuals in the <clears throat> audience today could help um, support, advocate for 211, um, what can we do to help? Well, I think we've got, so we've got um, Julio Alonzo is on our board, um, Hoosier Hills Food, from Hoosier Hills Food Bank. Um, and I think that's really getting the information, you know, when your community is um, identifying needs is, is making sure that we're getting connected. Reach out to me, reach out to Jamie. You know, we, we want to hear the feedback and, and what's important. So as your, as your community is identifying needs, um, and again, like Jamie said, we, we have a really robust data um, set of systems within FSSA. So it's taking us some time to get that data. Actually, we have a meeting today about actually getting the data over in FSSA so that we can create some dynamic reporting you would be able to go in and look at what is happening with 211 in your community. And then from that, like you said, making those strategic decisions about where you need to go with your funding and your programs. Um, so hopefully we can also inform you as you are informing us um, through the advisory board or just you know making contact with us. Obviously we can't meet everyone's needs all the time, but hearing that information, that feedback is really important. So on our website, it lists all of the advisory board members. So right. I would recommend, you know, going to that, I, I guarantee there's somebody in your area connected to the advisory board yeah. and, and maybe touching base with them, or like I said, directly, you know, contacting us because we do want to hear from the community, um, but we also have to figure out what are the needs, what are our goals and make sure that we continue aligning that as we move forward and plan. Yeah, and I think we we all uh, many of us know Mr. Alonzo, so that's uh, that's great to hear that um, he's involved. We know um, he he's a very dedicated um, leader in our community and and is a great person to have on your advisory board. That's great. Um, you you talked a little bit about county to county, and um, there's a, a question about. The coverage of services and do you do you feel um, they're evenly distributed across the state or you know what do you see in terms of um, that sort of geographic coverage of services available are some counties more difficult to connect people to resources um, are, are, are other counties just really easy it does that do you do you see that from those rates of met and unmet needs I'll let Jamie take this one. Well, honestly, a lot of it is just based on population. Um, you know, the, the counties that have more people um, obviously are going to have more people that are, are impacted by poverty and by, you know, ch everyday challenges. So we do have counties that we absolutely, you know, kind of see rise to the top as far as call volume. Uh, but we have counties, I'm going to use Lake County as an example. Uh, technically, I think it is the, the next populated area after Marion County, uh, but it is underutilized. Uh, 211 is just unfortunately doesn't have the awareness that it needs in that county. So uh, a lot of times what we're doing when we look at that is just finding out where do we need to build those relationships? Where do we need to build our awareness? Those relationships really impact the, the way the service is utilized and the, um, you know, how many, how many people from that county are calling. Um, if we have a good relationship and we've got our connections that are out talking about 211 and giving us updated information, that's ideal. And that's, that's when we're able best to serve an area. Excellent, thank you. I think we have time for one last question and we've got one here. Um, so th this may be a, a specific one um, and maybe Glenda, you could stay on and, and uh, we can try to answer this if it's a, a lengthy answer, but um, are there agencies that have case managers to help people overcome a variety of issues? Um, if the person was a senior, she'd refer them to area agency on aging, but who can help a young couple that got into a lot of problems and needs help sorting out a lot of challenges? So I don't know if you wanna speak to that. Um, I know it's, it's a more specific one. Yeah, you know, again, the programs are different all across the state. 
Um, there are absolutely programs that will serve just an individual or a couple. A lot of programs, though, you do have to have a child or mom has to be pregnant in order to get into services. But that's where, um, when I talked about the brainstorming, we kind of have to be a detective and kind of piece those things together for them. And maybe it's first getting them connected to, you know, a GED class or a township trustee or something like that. But it's just, I mean, really getting them surrounded by the support sometimes when that case management is not available. Um, sometimes when we think of case management, we think of somebody coming into the home and meeting with them regularly, but there are so many people in the community that can keep people supported, so. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, well, with that, I, I would just like to, again, say thank you so much uh, to both of you for being here today to kick off uh, 2 on one day um, throughout the state. Thank you, you chose to start, uh, to wake up with United Way to do so, um, and we learned a lot. And uh, attendees, you'll receive an email um, with a summary and with um, resources, uh, how to contact your legislators if you want to um, show your support that way. Um, that stay tuned for that. But uh, also mark on your calendars, March 11th. That is our next Wake Up With United Way. It's every second Thursday of the month at this time. And that one um, will be on whether we are facing an eviction tsunami. We've uh, been hearing that phrase um, as moratoriums are lifted and um, a lot of attention is, is being paid to this and, and there's a lot of unknowns. We're gonna explore that with a panel of experts, local experts, and, and have that dialogue about what we're seeing in our community in terms of evictions, which we know impact a whole lot of other things. Um, and then, the, as I mentioned, the whole series um, in 2021, we, we're gonna be talking about rebuilding from the pandemic and together rethink how we address challenges like homelessness, food security, workers' rights. Um, we're ever grateful for the sponsors that are helping us to do this this year. So once again, a big shout out to Bloomington Township, to IU Credit Union and the Community Foundation of Bloomington Monroe County, to Duke Energy, to Old National Bank, um, to our co-collaborators at IU's PACE Political and Civic Engagement Program. And once again, a, a big um, round of applause for our, our speakers who were so informative. Um, thank you for all you're doing at the state. Thank you, Peggy Welch. Um, and thank you each for being here and waking up with United Way to um, learn more about 211 and um, all of the things that they've been up to. It's, it's tremendous and we're just grateful for all that you're doing, um, especially in in this crazy, <laughs> crazy past year. So big round of applause and thanks again everyone for waking up with United Way.